One of my friends is known to refer to this as the happy seminary. <laughs> and the reason for that, almost inevitably, comes from the top. That is to say, the mood and tone of a seminary almost always are established by the president. So I am especially grateful to come back to where President Aiken has served so well. I'd like you to open your Bibles, or I suppose there are enough here under a certain age, turn on your Bibles, <laughs> to Matthew chapter 13. But before I read some of this chapter, I want to sidle up to it. Why does Jesus tell stories? Why the narrative parables? Well, it's easy enough to outline some wrong answers, or at least reductionistic answers. Number one, Jesus used them as illustrations. He was a good homiletician, so he'd make a point, then he'd illustrate it, tell a story. But then you have a hard job understanding chapter 13, verses 11 and 12. Why do you speak to the people in parables, the disciples ask in verse 10? Jesus replies, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. In this passage, it doesn't sound as if parables are used for illustrative purposes to make things clearer. Others say Jesus told parables because he favored the enigmatic the thought-provoking, the open-ended, rather than truths and propositions. And so some who take this stance look at verse 34. Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. And so if we're going to preach effectively today, then we should tell stories in order to be enigmatic. Away with this tough, propositional, down-the-line, thunder-from-heaven stuff. Tell stories. But, although Jesus certainly can be enigmatic, and he can tell stories in order to illustrate something, yet he also preaches in other genres. He preaches with wisdom-type utterances, where it's either this or that. There are two ways, one that is broad and large and leads to destruction, the other that is narrow and straight and leads to life. There are two kinds of trees, one that produces good fruit, one that produces bad fruit, and so on. These are very wisdom-type structures. Moreover, he can preach in apocalyptic categories. He can use proverbs. He can use extended discourse, lament, Exposition of Old Testament texts, non-narratival extended metaphors, as in John 10 and the shepherd, John 15 and the vine, dialogue, provocative questions. So whatever 1334 means, it certainly does not mean that the only thing he ever used in preaching was parables. All you have to do is read the New Testament to discover that's not true. When it says he did not say anything to them without using a parable, what it means is in the course of his regular preaching, he regularly had parables. Others say he told parables in order to hide things from the non-elect. After all, we did read verses 11 and 12, which certainly sound as if part of the purposes of parables is to hide things. Yes, but then there is verse 34 and verse 35. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. So was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. At this juncture, it sounds as if parables are disclosing things, not hiding them. So the question is, why did Jesus tell parables? I think there is some element of truth in these and other answers that could be given, but let me give you two overwhelming reasons why Jesus told parables. 
And before I do, I'm going to read chapter 13, verses 10 to 17, and then some verses toward the end of the chapter. So hear the word of the Lord from Matthew 13, beginning at verse 10. This is right after Jesus has told the parable of the good Samaritan, of the uh, sower. The disciples came to him and asked, why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing they do not see, though hearing they do not hear or understand, in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing but never understanding. You will be ever seeing but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. For truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Verse 34, Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. So was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. Verse 52. Therefore, every teacher of the law who has become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. This is the word of the Lord. So let me give two reasons then why Jesus told parables. This is not an exhaustive list but two reasons, and then the next two days we'll focus on some biblical parables to make the point. Number one, Jesus tells parables because in line with Scripture, his message blinds, deafens, and hardens. Let me repeat that. Jesus tells parables because in line with Scripture, his message blinds, deafens, and hardens. Now reread verses 10 and 12, and you will see right away that there is a contrast that is set up. And once the contrast is set up, then the rest of the passage is divided into two parts. So, verse 10, the question, why do you speak to the people in parables? Then Jesus divides his answer in two parts setting up a contrast, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, that's positive, but not to them, that's negative. Whoever has will be given more, they will have an abundance, that's positive. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them, that's negative. And then the negative is further expounded in verses 13, 14, and 15. And then the positive is expounded in verses 16, 17, and 18. That's the structure of these verses. But the negative side, which we're going to focus on first, verses 13, 14, and 15, is largely cast in terms of quotations from Isaiah 6. And so I invite you to turn to that passage, Isaiah 6. I'm sure you are familiar with it. Isaiah, the prophet, has been preaching for some time, but in the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah says, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. There are set a theme there with six wings, two to cover their lower parts, a certain kind of humility and reticence, two to fly, speed, to cover his commands, and two, to hide their faces because they dare not look on him whom to see is death. And they cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. The very foundations of the temple shake. And Isaiah testifies, 
that he's a lost man. In the previous chapters, he's pronouncing the woes of God, the condemnations of God against corruption and greed and idolatry, against evil in all of its forms, against drunkenness and debauchery and lack of faith. Woe to you, woe to you, woe to you. And now he sees God and he says, woe to me. I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and mine eyes have seen the king. The king, not the king who just died, King Uzziah. My eyes have seen the king, the Lord Almighty. One of the seraphim takes a live coal from the altar, touches Isaiah's lips. After all, he said that he's a man of unclean lips. Now a coal from the altar touches his lips to clean him up. As if to say, it takes the sacrifice that God has ordained to clean you up. The angel says to him, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And then for the first time in this chapter, God speaks. It's almost as if he's asking a rhetorical question to the councils of heaven. Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah says, here am I, send me. Don't misunderstand this. He's not saying, I'm your man, God. Bring it on. And the context is just the opposite. He's saying, uh, excuse me, what would I do, hmm? please? Could you use me? Away with this arrogance with which people approach ministry. And God says, go. Now let me tell you what you have to preach. This is what you have to do. Tell this people, be ever hearing but never understanding. Be seeing but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. How would you like that preached at your ordination service? And Isaiah says the obvious thing. Well, okay, Lord, I mean, there are cycles in ministry. I understand that. This could go on for a while, but for how long? I mean, when will revival finally come? I mean, if I preach faithfully all this time and, and all of these bad things are happening, when will revival start? How long, Lord? And he answered, verse 11, until the cities lie ruined without inhabitant, until the houses are left deserted and the fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away and the land is utterly forsaken. And though a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. That's how long. You've got a whole life of ministry where there is nothing to show at the end of it except waste and condemnation. That's your job, Isaiah. Go. And the only spark of hope in the entire chapter is the last two lines. But as the terebinth and oak have stumps when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. And with that stump left, the structure of the book of Isaiah picks it up again in chapter 11, one of the great passages of hope. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. And now you have a Christological promise that ends in apocalyptic transformation until the whole earth is filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. But of course, you have to remember that would take place 700 years after the end of his ministry. And these are the words that Jesus quotes when he explains what he's doing with his parables. These words from Isaiah. Probably the closest notion in the New Testament is found in John chapter 8.45. In John 8.45, 
Jesus says to some of his opponents, because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Note, that's not a concessive. Although I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. That would be bad enough. But he says with a causal, because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. In other words, it is the truth itself which, for some people, blinds. It's the truth itself which hardens. It's the truth itself that guarantees unbelief. If you talk to a culture which is absolutely, steadfastly committed to the view that there are many ways to God, and then you say the truth, there is only one way to God, you guarantee their unbelief. You guarantee that they think you're a bigot. They guarantee that they are convinced you, you guarantee that they are convinced that you are narrow-minded, right-wing, and ignorant. It's the very truth that causes offense on occasion. Do you see? Because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Thus, it is the faithful preaching of the truth itself which for some people at some points in history guarantees unbelief. So what are your options? Tell untruth? Trim the message? In effect, therefore, Isaiah is commanded to harden them, not because he's saying, I want to make you hard, but because he's commanded to preach the truth. And if he's commanded to preach the truth to this particular group at this particular point in history, then the effect is guaranteed, namely that they will be hardened and blinded, coarsened and deafened. All he's got to do is preach the truth. And Jesus, we're told, fulfills this text. He fulfills this pattern. In them, verse 14 of Matthew 13, is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, you will be ever hearing but never understanding, you will be ever seeing but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become callous. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Of course, Jesus, as earlier in Matthew, indicated that there is a trajectory of unbelief. At the end of the Beatitudes, in Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 and 12, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. There's a trajectory of unbelief. And Jesus brings that trajectory to fulfillment. Where Jesus is aware of how some are being blinded by the light, he uses more parabolic teaching. That's what he says, verses 11 and 12. In line with chapter 7, verse 6, he knows not to cast his pearls before swine. He is prepared to preach in such a way that they will not get it. It is part of judgment. And after all, that notion is found on occasion in the New Testament as well. Do you recall what Paul writes to the Thessalonians in his second letter? There we read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning at verse 10. Certain people perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion. In other words, He hardens them. They love the lie. They don't want to be saved. They can't stand the truth. And God, therefore, as it were, imposes the final judgment back into time. He sends them a strong delusion so they are hardened in their delusion. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. In other words, one of the reasons why Jesus tells parables is because in line with Scripture, His message blinds, deafens, and hardens. Number two. Jesus tells parables because, in line with Scripture, 
His message reveals things hidden in Scripture. I repeat, Jesus tells parables because in line with Scripture, His message reveals things hidden in Scripture. Now focus on verses 34 and 35. We'll come back to chapter 13, verses 16 to 18 in a moment. But at the moment, focus on verses 34 and 35. And once again, we discover Jesus appeals to an Old Testament text. Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. So was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. This is a quotation from Psalm 78, verse 2. Psalm 78 is one of the so-called historical psalms. God unpacks in a psalm something of Israel's history, but he does so in such a way as to make certain points. You see, history is never exhaustive. You can't possibly explain everything that happened about anything. It's inevitably selective. So that you can tell the same story from different perspectives by simply including or excluding certain details. So it's possible to tell the story of the Civil War from a northern perspective and from a southern perspective. It's possible to tell the story of the Revolutionary War from the perspective of Americans. It looks a little different in Britain. And in between there are, I speak now as someone born in Canada, I, there, there are the UELs, we call them, the United Empire Loyalists, thousands of Americans who went north of the 49th parallel because they wanted to remain loyal to the crown. They look at things a little differently too. In fact, some people have done their PhDs on the sermons of the UEL Christians versus the sermons of the American Christians, and both are claiming Scripture. Ooh, that's embarrassing. So it's possible, you see, to tell the story of America in grandiose and wonderful terms about how the Pilgrim Fathers came here and wanted freedom and, and, and so forth, and um, they wanted to build a, 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 new, um, a new place where it was safe for the gospel and to build a, a light, a city set on a hill. And, um, and, and then you could talk about their sacrifices and, and um, the, 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 the way the, the, the 13 colonies grew on the East Coast and eventually moved west and, and, and settled and, and the, there was commerce and, and glory. Yes, struggles with England, 1812, 1814, and all, all of that. But, but nevertheless, uh, uh, finally established a glory. Yes, there was, um, there was the shame of, of, of slavery, but, but we did get through that, didn't we? And, 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 and now we've come out the the other side and we should be grateful for the grace of God in this respect and, and, and at least we, we did eventually do the right thing and, and, and besides that um, we came to the rescue of Europe not once but twice in, 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 in the 20th century and, and so on and so on and so on. We prevailed against communism simply by holding the line and holding the line and being a robust economy until finally they collapsed and so on. It's all true. It's all true. It's wonderfully true. But then, of course, somebody else can come along and tell the story. They came in here and took over the land of the Indians, and yeah, they said there was freedom for all, but they still had slaves and so on, and tell the whole story and slant it all a different way. All you have to do is read the press to find out how often the story is told that way. A fair bit of that's true, too. And, and you know, I, I, I could tell you this, similar stories regarding the Canada from which I spring. I could paint a glorious Canada. I can paint a pretty shameful Canada, what we've done to the Inuit, the Eskimos. I could do the same thing for the British Empire. I could do the same thing for parts of Chinese history. Because every country has some things for which to be proud and some things of which to be deeply ashamed. So, how will Jews think of Israelite history? On the one hand, you see, you could say, you know, God chose us. Of all the nations of the earth, he chose us. That's what Deuteronomy 7, Deuteronomy 10 says. He, he chose us because he loved us, but he did choose us. 
and made Jerusalem to be a city on a hill too. Promised a great messianic king. He, he reveals himself in glory at the tabernacle in the temple that he has established himself. Gave us a great body of law, the, the word of God, the books of the law. Gave us a man like Moses. Raised up prophets again and again and again. When we sinned, he rescued us. Yes, he sometimes punished us but by sending us into exile, but he, he, he restored us back to himself again and again and again. We are the people of God. All true? And then you read Psalm 78. And now the psalmist presents the, is, the, the history of Israel in, in, in rather, ra- rather painful terms. They remind you a bit of Stephen's speech in Acts chapter 7. That's another sermon that begins with the history of Israel. But Stephen slants the history to show how often people rejected the revelation that God sent. God sent prophets and God sent the law. God sent various people he raised up to teach the people the way of God and they rejected them again and again and again. So it's not too surprising that when he finally sends the Messiah, they reject the Messiah too. He builds a whole theology that warrants the rejection of the Messiah precisely by reading Old Testament history. And there's something of that going on in Psalm 78. Don't you remember your own history, he says? You look back at the, your own history and you see how many times people complained and whined and were disgruntled with God in the desert. And as a preface to this psalm, the writer says, my people hear my teaching, listen to the words of my mouth. Verse 2 in the NIV has, I will open my mouth with a parable, I will utter hidden things, things of old. The new NIV has, I will open my mouth with a parable. I will utter hidden things, things of old. And you start asking if they're hidden. Why does verse 3 go on to say, things we have heard and known, things our ancestors have told us. If they're things that we have known and our ancestors have told us, why are they hidden things? things that we have not known. But you see, that's the way the expounding of history is. Even when you know the data, as it were, the materials are there, there are new lessons that are being brought out of them. So that when Stephen, for example, teaches from the Old Testament, the actual data that he refers to are all known. It's common ground. It's the raw data of history, but they are so configured that lessons are brought out that they hadn't thought of at all. Do you see? And that's what Psalm 78 is doing. It's an historical psalm that looks at Israel's history to bring forth moral lessons, which most Jews at the time of the psalmist were not ready to hear. They thought themselves as a bit too hot, too privileged. They didn't see their own history as a massive call for repentance. And that's what Jesus does himself. He takes the Old Testament and now he says things that have been hidden. Go back to verse 11. Chapter 13, verse 11. Why do you speak to the people in parables? Because... The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom, the NIV has. Some translations have the mysteries of the kingdom. What does that mean, the mysteries of the kingdom? Not the mysterious things of the kingdom. That's not what mystery means in the New Testament. The word mystery is used 27 or 28 times. There's one variant. And in either every case or just about every case, the word mystery refers to that which has been hidden in the past but is now disclosed. So I'm going to tell you, he says, I'm going to make you understand, to you it has been given to understand, the mysteries of the kingdom. That is, things hidden in the past that are now disclosed. They're hidden. But they're hidden in plain sight. They are there in the text, but they're hidden, and now I disclose them to you. The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. That is, Jesus tells parables now because in line with Scripture, his message reveals things hidden in Scripture. What does this mean? What does this look like? 
Well, take a look at the parable of the sower, which is the context in which Jesus says these things. What's the parable of the sower about? You have to remember, you see, that most Jews expected that when the Messiah came, he would come with a bang. There would be clear differentiation between the just and the unjust. The kingdom would be established. All you have to do is read the, the preaching of John the Baptist to see what that looks like. When he comes, he will gather the wheat into barns and he will thoroughly th clear his threshing floor and cast the chaff into unquenchable fire. Matthew chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. That's what Jews expected would happen when the kingdom came. And what Jesus says is, no, the, the kingdom is a bit like a farmer who goes out to sow. He scatters seed here and there, you know. Some of it falls on good soil. Some of it falls on bad soil. The birds take it away. Some places are rocky, shallow, shallow, shallow soil. That soil warms up the fastest in the spring because it's so shallow. The seed germinates. It looks as if it's going to be the most promising of the crop, and then the Middle East sun pelts down, and the, the plant keels over and dies. Other seed falls amongst thorns, and the thorns just choke the life out of it. It never does produce fruit. But some seed falls on good ground of various degrees of productivity. That's what the kingdom is like. What? I thought it came with a bang. I thought God was going to clean up the whole mess. You're just making things confusing. And so the, par the parable is not understood by, by the people who, who are hearing it. And, and even the Christians, the believers, the Christians to be, th they don't understand it as well, although Jesus does carefully, un carefully unpack it for them in the following verses. Now, how does that come from the Old Testament? But it does. It does. Take a look, for example, at Daniel chapter 2, the great vision of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Daniel interprets the dream. The various body parts, the head of the statue made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, and so on. Then 234, while you were watching, Daniel says to Nebuchadnezzar, describing the dream, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace. Oh, here's a vision, you see, of the kingdom of God coming with a bang. And then in the vision we read, but the rock that struck the statue grew to become a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. Now you've got growth. Not a bang. But where is the evidence that Jews got those bits put together before the coming and explanations of Christ? Or to take an example that's better known yet. In Caesarea Philippi, we're now in chapter 13, Caesarea Philippi is chapter 16, Jesus says, who do people say that I am? Some say this, some say that. So he asks his own apostles, what do you say? Peter says, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus responds, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Great. But does Peter mean by his confession what you and I mean when we confess that Jesus is the Christ? Nope. Because when you and I confess that Jesus is the Christ, we cannot help but think of Christ crucified, Christ on the cross, dead, buried, risen again, ascended to the Father's right hand. Do you see, we cannot help but think of Christ in these holistic categories, but those are not categories that Peter understands. Because when Jesus then goes on in the context of Matthew 16 to talk about his own impending death, Peter, having scored once theologically, thinks he'll try again. Never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Messiahs don't die. They win. Hmm? Especially one like you can do all these nice miracles, you know? This will never happen to you. You're wrong on this one, Jesus. Jesus wheels on him and says, get behind me, Satan. You do not understand the things of God. 
So then why is Peter told that he's blessed? Because he does confess that Jesus is the Messiah. Because while others are doubting that Jesus is the Davidic Messiah, the promised king, Peter, anointed by God himself, really does grasp that Jesus is the Messiah. But he doesn't have all the categories for Messiahship. He doesn't see that this king must also be the suffering servant. He doesn't see that this king will reign from a cross. He doesn't see that. And the proof that he doesn't see it carries on in the entire gospel so that after Jesus is, is actually in the tomb, Peter and the rest of the apostles are in an upstairs room, frightened for fear of the Jews. What are they doing up there? Are they saying, oh, yes, I can hardly wait till Sunday. Will they be surprised? He still doesn't know that the Messiah must die. He doesn't have it. Even though five times in Matthew's gospel alone, Jesus is unpacked that he's the sword of Messiah who must die and give his life. Do you see? Well, tell me, is that announced in Scripture? Well, there's the Passover. There's Yom Kippur. There are passages like Isaiah 53 he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. There are psalms like Psalm 69 where the Davidic king is broken and crushed, betrayed by his own familiar friend and that sort of thing. But you really cannot find any Jews of Jesus' generation before the cross who simply got it together and believed that Jesus was simultaneously the Davidic promised triumphant king and the suffering slaughtered damned servant. But it was there in Scripture. They just hadn't got it together. One of the reasons Jesus tells parables, he says, is to unpack this change slowly. In a way analogous to what the historical Psalms do. I will open my mouth in parables where you tell stories compare things with things. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. But nevertheless, things which in the context of Psalm, Psalm 78, your fathers have known. Your fathers knew about, Psalm, about Isaiah 53. They just didn't get it together. Which is why when you read on in verse 16, Blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. For truly, I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. So many of the Old Testament saints could not put all the pieces together, which is why at the end of the chapter we read, Verse 52, therefore, every teacher of the law who has become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. You open the Old Testament scriptures, and now you're putting them together in ways that people haven't seen before. They are truly there, but, but, but they have not been put together. They've been hidden a little bit. Now, what should we learn from these passages? We could easily spend a half hour unpacking this. Let me summarize. Number one, we should gain wonder in worship where there is a fresh grasp of how God has put the Bible together. We should gain wonder in worship where there is a fresh grasp of how God has put the Bible together. Have you ever asked yourself, you know, I know that, you know, my Old Testament professors here, my New Testament professors here, my systematics professors here and others, they're all trying to show me how to read the Old Testament in a Christological way and in a Christ-centered way and so on. And, 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 you know, more or less I see it. I'm beginning to understand what typology is and I'm beginning to understand these trajectories that run from the Old Testament to the New Testament and all that. But, but you know, I don't, I don't want to be blasphemous or irreverent or anything, yet couldn't God have done it a little more simply. Hmm? Am I the only one who's ever thought that? Why not just be a bit more straightforward? Okay, I'll rewrite Isaiah 53. This is Isaiah 53 according to Don Carson, who thinks that he can do it better than God. 
It shall come to pass in those days, says the Lord, that, in, that there will be a Roman emperor by the name of Augustus Caesar. Footnote. I know there's no Roman Empire yet. <laughs> You're still at the tail end of the Assyrian Empire, but the Babylonians are going to beat the Assyrians up. And then the Medo-Persians are going to beat the Babylonians up. And then the Greeks are going to beat the Medo-Persians up. And they're going to degenerate into four generals, and eventually Rome's going to beat them up. At the moment, you've got seven little villages on the left bank of the Tiber, but they're going to come together and form the city of Rome. Rome is going to beat all of Italy, and then out of all of Italy, there will come a, a new mighty empire, an empire of iron that will be very strong, and it, it, it will beat up the Greeks, and, and, and it will eventually take over the whole thing. And one of the families, by the name of Caesar, will become so prominent that Caesar will almost become a code word for king. And one particular one is called Augustus, and that's the guy I'm talking about. Back to the main text. <laughs> in the realm of this, in the reign of this Caesar Augustus, he will issue a decree that the entire world, footnote, the Roman world, of course, back to the text, should be enrolled for taxation. And as a result, and now you have the whole story of the narratives, you know, filled out, the, the birth in Bethlehem of Judea and the angels predicted and, and the name of Mary and the name of Joseph and, and the wise men coming. And the, the, then you, you build up the whole narrative of Jesus and eventually you have this governor by the name of Pilate who's washing his hands in water and, 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 and so on. Now, wouldn't that be a wingding of a prophecy? Haven't I done a really good job here? Put yourself in Pilate's place. Yeah, there's that prophecy out. There's no way I'm going to wash my hands. Absolutely no way. <laughs> and of course, if he doesn't, then the whole prophecy falls to its feet. It's destroyed. But if he does, something's dragging my hands over there. I can't stop it. I, I can't stop it. You think you've got problems with God's sovereignty and the mystery of providence now? You've got nothing yet. <laughs> Can you imagine how many little girls would be called Mary and how many boys would be called Joseph? Can you imagine? And because, because they've got to come from Nazareth, can you imagine what the population of Nazareth would be? No, 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 no. God in His great wisdom Reveal so very much, but in shadows and types and structures. And you don't really get them all together until after the events. And then those with eyes to see look back and say, spectacular. Here is the mind of our God. The first thing to gain then is this, wonder in worship where there is a fresh grasp of how God has put the Bible together. Let me simply tell you the other two. We should gain gratitude in humility for the gift of seeing the truth about Jesus and his gospel because so many people do not see it. That's a gift. Number three, we should gain discretion in witness where there is a hostile environment. For we too understand, as Isaiah understood, as Jesus understood, as Paul understood, that sometimes the environment is so hostile that you must approach these things with a certain kind of discretion, understanding that the truth itself can blind and harden and deafen as well as reveal. Let us pray. In truth, Lord God, open our eyes that we may understand how your most holy word is put together by your own sovereign decree to bring us to Jesus and his cross and resurrection, without which we are lost and undone. For Jesus' sake, amen.